Welcome to another episode of Healing Through Love. Each week, we share ideas, experiences, and resources to increase the awareness of domestic and family violence and to empower survivors to grow and thrive. We talk with experts who share their advice or with people who have experienced abuse, no matter where they are on their journey. This is all about healing through love. And now, here are your hosts, Charlene Lynch and Rose Davidson. The Healing Through Love podcast with host Charlene Lynch and Rose Davidson would love to acknowledge Global Glamping Charities Incorporated for generously supporting this podcast. Global Glamping Charities, solving homelessness in all of its forms. Reach out to them at globalglamping.org. The Healing Through Love podcast with Charlene Lynch and Rose Davidson. Mel Belmont in episode 45 discusses with us how we can learn to manage ourselves as empaths. Everything in life, walking, running, everything is being mastered and some things we can put more effort into than others. So being aware of what what is going on when we are awake, what we are saying to ourselves and we kind of come across there's a Dove advert. Oh, it's probably 10, 15 years old now. In fact, Dove, I've done a whole series of different adverts about how people talk to themselves and they get actors to say the things that the person's written out that they tell themselves. And they, they've done like social experiments and put them in cafes where an actor repeats the exact phrases that the other person would say to themselves. And something like eight or nine out of 10 times, people would interrupt them saying, that is disgraceful. You don't speak to people like that. The Healing Through Love podcast with Charlene Lynch and Rose Davidson. Hello and welcome to the Healing Through Love podcast. I'm your host, Rose Davidson from rosedavidson.com. Healing Through Love is a social enterprise whose mission is to bring awareness to the community of domestic and family violence survivors and uh, how it affects them and their and their families. Uh, we have free Pamper Day events every year uh, in Adelaide, where businesses come together and share their resources and uh, and their time with our survivors to give them a, a much needed day of indulgence and love. Today, my guest is Mel Belmont, and she is one of my favourite people because she just speaks so well, and I just love her topic of um, quantum coaching and healing. And today, we're going to be talking about from chaos to calm for empaths, and we're going to be learning how to manage ourselves as empaths, particularly against narcissistic and uh, behaviours and persons and dark empaths. And Mel is often referred to as the deep belief hacker, and she loves to support high-performing, thought-changing entrepreneurs. By mastering her hypersensitivities, she navigated to shores of calm, confident, and happiness by sailing through her mid-storms. Her passionate personality combines spirituality and neuro-knowledge with the science of assessing our subconscious to hack our belief systems with award-winning results. She is an absolute delight to speak with. Mel, welcome to Healing Through Love. Oh, hello. Heavy talk, but I will try and keep it light for you. Thank you. Now, I know a little bit about, you know, the quantum healing because we've had discussions about it before, but tell me, um, and tell our viewers and, and listeners, what is quantum healing? Well, a quantum is, I'm just going to turn you up a bit. A quantum is the smallest measurement. So you can have a quantum of anything. So for me, quantum healing is the smallest or in the context of subconscious, the furthest back 
emotion. The, uh, the smallest measurement of our memory or the essence of the emotion that is stored in our body, our psyche, or even in our energetic field. So that's what quantum healing is. Finding those minute little, little trigger things that are stuck there, just hidden away and finding them. So how do we go about finding these little triggers that, that you know, follow us around? Yeah, great question. How do we find them? Well, I call it mind web analysis. And what that like simply means is I, I, I finding what the original, the source cause or the oldest memory or the oldest scenario that set in a set of energies or beliefs or um, attachments, some DNA damage. Uh, often this comes from our past lives. It can even happen during womb um, development and or during birth. And we, we hear of these kind of terms, but how do we find them? By accessing a subconscious. Kind of that simple. And even accessing our subconscious isn't a hard thing. This isn't even kind of airy fairy woo anymore. This is, science backs this. And it's using the really practical techniques to get more intangible emotional benefits down the track. Mm. Yeah. So, you know, how do we reach our subconscious? You know, people, I mean, our subconscious is awake all the time. Even when we're asleep, our subconscious is awake. But how do we reach it uh, in a, at a conscious level when, uh, you know, un- <laughs> Yeah, how do we reach it when we're like at a conscious level so that we can find the subconscious things that need to be fixed? Mm, well, the easiest answer I've got is by accessing through meditation, theta hypnosis, altered states where we're switching off our conscious brain, which is our logic, which is our critical thinking. It's all the forward stuff to access the back stuff, which as you quite rightly said, is always operating whether we like it, whether we're aware in it, aware of it, or whether we even believe in it. It is always working. And simple explanations or examples of that is driving. We know when we can tune out and we're suddenly three kilometers down the road going, oh, I wasn't even aware that I passed my favorite shop back there. We're on autopilot so much of the time blinking, breathing, all of that stuff happens subconsciously. Now that is driven by body, but the thinking and the logic that is, uh, sorry, the behaviors and the uh, emotions that are driving the thinking and the logic, they're either happening with our awareness or not. So how do we access it? By theta state is my preferred. That's what my process is, which is that state between if you watch the movies, uh, the point of inception, it's where you know that you're dreaming, but you're still in the dream. It's just that state between subconscious sleeping and awake. So when you can get into that state, you get all of your mind thinking, blah, 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 get it out the way. And you're accessing your truest wisdom. Those parts of your brain that actually knows exactly what's going on. Mm. There's a DV survivor myself um and so I have the lived experience of that and there are a lot of traumas that come you know with that and and a lot of the um behaviors that we have after we've escaped this the 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 situation um we're sometimes not aware of they just sort of uh happen automatically so that's obviously our subconscious state keeping us safe the lizard brain I suppose you would call it Um, for those that you know don't know what conscious and unconscious states are but yeah the lizard brain is at the back and um, and um, so how do we um, become aware of those behaviors and 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 make changes to them so that we feel safer big question Uh, I will attempt to answer this as succinctly as I can The easiest way is by acknowledging what we are feeling and thinking. Mm. Now, to become aware 
actually isn't as simple if you've never done it before. I know when I first started, I couldn't really understand the difference. And it, it takes a level of mastery. And everything in life, walking, running, everything is being mastered. And some things we can put more effort into than others. So being aware of what, what is going on when we are awake, what we are saying to ourselves, and we kind of come across, there's a Dove advert, oh, it's probably 10, 15 years old now. In fact, Dove, I've done a whole series of different adverts about how people talk to themselves and they get actors to say the things that the person's written out that they tell themselves. And they, they've done like social experiments and put them in cafes where an actor repeats the exact phrases that the other person would say to themselves. And something like eight or nine out of 10 times, people would interrupt them saying, that is disgraceful. You don't speak to people like that. Mm. But that is how we talk to ourselves. Really normal, everyday, common experiences. We really are down in ourselves. So what happens is, especially if we get into the subject of DV, self-esteem is already damaged in any sort. So let's talk about what domestic violence is, right? It's all of the forms of control, emotional, mental, physical, financial, um, animal control, all of the different types are now thankfully considered as a, a level of domestic violence, uh, domestic um, abuse. abuse. Thank you. Um, violence doesn't always have to be the cause of abuse. So if you've got someone who's saying you'll never account amount to anything or you'll never be able to manage the accounts on your own or you'll nobody will want you. If you're hearing these kinds of messages, the language that you use with yourself changes. It absolutely this isn't even under discussion. This is a fact. The way you think of yourself changes the more you hear these messages. And that's part of the problem with empaths and narcissists and or dark empaths, which is a whole different category again. Dark empaths know they're doing it. Narcissists are on a spectrum and sometimes they do, sometimes they don't know. But they, dark narcissists, uh, dark empaths know what they're doing to erode the self-esteem so they can control the person. So if you've got someone deliberately manipulating you and then you have your own layers of self-doubt. And then maybe you grew up with not the best role models. There's so much negativity going on in our mind and we don't even know. We, we haven't even been taught because what happens is when people leave these kind of circumstances, it's then they start to become aware. It's not very often in the midst of it that they become aware of their own thinking. They become aware of how the behaviors aren't acceptable, and that's usually why they leave. But to catch themselves thinking in it is a really rare situation. It's not until you can come away from it, breathe again, as you say, feel safe, which can take years, if not decades, to catch what we're thinking, to catch what we're saying to ourselves, to, to catch how we are believing in our own potential. And it's tragic to see how how broken the mindset is, not the soul, but the mindset is really fragmented and overlaid with really, really toxic, nasty thinking. Mm. That's the number one thing to help people stay away from the abuser, to stay away from future relationships that can stay in that cycle. So I don't know if I answered your question. It was a broad. You yeah, no, you did very well. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. And, and, we, you know, we do have to change our belief systems because, you know, usually, I mean, whether you come from an abusive childhood or abusive marriage or relationship, um, even a friendship, you can be abusive. Siblings, uh, yeah. Um, you know, when you come away from those, you, you do have those negative thoughts all the time. Am I good enough? You know, am I wearing the right clothes? Am I acting my age? Am I this and am I do that? And we have this, do have this negative self-talk that we perpetuate forever and ever and ever. And sometimes we don't, um, we don't realise that we're doing it because it's such a habit. 
Yeah. And that that's the the key is to become aware of those habits of thinking and to shift in. And people people talk about self-love. And I, I remember when I first started getting a life coach, and I'm I'm casting back to my memories. Um I remember being told you're talking from your head. I used to get so frustrated. I'm like I don't freaking know what you're I don't what understand does that mean? what you're saying. What does <laughs> what the fuck does that mean? And it, it's not until now, not only do I not do that, but I'm aware of it, but I can spot it so easily in somebody else. So it's a skill that can be learned, absolutely can be harnessed like any other skill. And I kind of like breaking down some of these barriers and going, there's nothing special about anybody who has some level of mastery other than they've spent time working on it. No different from the tennis star or the um, the child pianist. They've spent time mastering it and then they become very good at it. We can all yeah. do that. Yeah, I mean, our, um, our mutual friend Charlotte, she taught me about the things I used to say to myself, you know, negative self-talk. And, and now 99% of the time I can pick myself up when I've said something um, bad about myself or, you know, like oh, that was like don't be a dickhead or stop being stupid or, and I'm not being stupid, I just made a mistake. And so I have to reframe the words to myself uh, so that my subconscious isn't listening, is listening to the good stuff and not listening to the bad things because your subconscious is always listening and the more you verbalise uh, bad thoughts about yourself, the more your subconscious will absorb that information and then then it will turn black and nasty. It doesn't know the difference between truth, fiction or fact. You know. So it's just listening, like you say, all the time. And like you said, it's catching yourself with what you're saying. And um, the, the way that we approach life can't always be roses, using your name there, uh, <laughs> sunshine and unicorns and rainbows. That, that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about why beat up on ourselves when life is already actually meant to be a challenge we're here on earth to learn something otherwise there in my view what is the point of our existence there is a reason spiritually religiously whatever your your thoughts or where your philosophies are there's got to be a purpose to life and if you don't believe in a purpose to life then why are you trying to improve yourself what does it matter anyway but the, for those of us who do is we need to cut ourselves some slack and give ourselves some grace when we make a mistake, what is a mistake anyway? What is perfection anyway? It doesn't exist. It's a set of rules or standards that society or someone else has placed upon you or that we're trying to live up to. Give yourself some grace and go, well, that didn't go to plan. Is it a mistake? Was someone to blame? Did someone fuck up? No, not necessarily. It just didn't go right. Hmm. Move on. Dude. Go, ah, I'm going to do that differently le- next time. This blame and really carving up our own worth. Going, oh, I messed up. It's like, well, actually I didn't, just the tech went wrong. Or actually it's just something completely outside my control. Why am I making it so? Tech is a really big, that's why I talk about the digital age. We blame ourselves. I'm not tech savvy. I used to say that at the start of my business. And then I kind of caught myself and went, what if tech was my friend? What if I stopped making tech wrong and moved with it with ease and flow and it happens? Now I do not get stressed the way I used to at all. It's like, okay, things go glitchy. Hmm. Yeah, I remember those days when um, when when we first met, and uh, you say, "I'm not tech savvy. I can't do this." And I thought, "Guess you can. If you just teach yourself, you can." Patience is a virtue. <laughs> yeah, and it's also well, it's not my wheelhouse. It's not my best skill. It's not my zone of genius. Whatever phrase you want to use, that's okay too. It can still work for you. 
Absolutely. Yeah. And really, uh, you know, patience is uh, can go a long way. If you just put your mind to something, you can master whatever it is that you're having issues with. Mm. Mm. Mel, um, I guess leading on from the, how can we as survivors uh, find that beautiful middle ground where we aren't walking on eggshells all the time and, you know, and, and find that nice green grass that we're all looking for? Oh, that's a good question. How can you enjoy? Okay. I'm thinking to some client examples. I think a big problem that many of us experience in life, not just domestic abuse, any challenge in life is we're always, we are often trying to be somewhere else into the future. We're either living into where we want to be and or escaping something that we don't like in the past, whether that's financial, whether that is abuse, whether that's just, is a crappy job and I want something better for myself. It doesn't always have to be dark and heavy. So we're kind of either running away from the past or running towards a future and we're not in the moment. Mm. And what does that mean? That means I have gratitude. What does that mean? I'm grateful that I'm not in that situation anymore and that I'm here, which is better than there. That's sometimes enough. I'm so proud of myself for having the courage to say that isn't acceptable anymore and this is my new standard. These are my new boundaries. That can be enough, doing that one day at a time. Because I've had quite a few clients who have gone through different levels of narcissistic exes or abuse, and they go back. And there's zero judgments from me. I've had one client four times go back. In fact, she's back with them now. It's your choice. I'm not attaching my opinions of your happiness, of your living to my set of standards. So that's number one. I'm not attached to an outcome that I think it should be, number two. And number three, you got to work it out for yourself. Mm. I can see that from the outside. You probably know it, but you haven't quite got the last piece of your own decision-making because everything ultimately comes down to choice. Now, caveat people, I know some people don't have options that makes decisions and choices harder. You don't have a car. You have children that you maybe need to stay for until you worked out what the plan is. You don't have a job. You don't have family. I get there are very limited options available, but you can still make the decision in your mind. As soon as these ducks are lined up, I'm out. Mm. As soon as I know A, B, and C has changed or shifted or that's happened, which has enabled something else to happen, the decision's made. And that is far more powerful sometimes than the actual step, although it's courageous to to make the decision to leave. And I know this because I've done it. I'm not speaking just from a hippy-dippy happy person. I escaped a man who raped me in the morning and in that moment in the bedroom no no more enough a flick switched and I I was like fuck no I know I know what's happening I have said no this is rape that's what I that's what it took for me to make that decision so in the moment was not the right time to stand up to my boundaries because it would have escalated for myself But in my head, I was working out where all my clothes were. I was planning my pack until he left. And that was before work. By lunchtime, I had gone. I pulled in sick, called in sick when he left. Mm. Gone by lunchtime. So the decision can be months before you're able to. The courage comes from following through afterwards. And it's hard when you've got no other options. You've got, I moved in with an 80-year-old neighbor 
because I was isolated from my family. I had no work colleagues. I had no social support system. But I also knew that if I went home, I wouldn't be good. Or rather, if I stayed when he got home at the end of the day. So I went to the neighbor next door. She had some ideas that something wasn't right. And she didn't tell him. He knocked on the door. She didn't give in. She was stronger than I was. And so the steps afterwards sometimes are more courageous when you've got no options. But I can also suggest that sometimes there's more help around, there's more support around than you even know. I remember going to work the next day with a black eye. I remember the looks of curious, sympathy. There was no condescending. There was no people going, oh, you should know better because they didn't know my circumstances. So there was kind of like, what's going on? And I was, oh, I think I was about 18 or 19 at the time, young. And the work colleagues all supported me. They, they, they saw a woman, a young lady who needed help, and they rallied around. I remember crying in the um, little staff room at the time, which was basically a janitor's closet. But I remember them two, two ladies, well, two ladies and a, a, a man. The man came and then went again when he worked out what was happening, one of my bosses. But then came back again and was like, is there anything else I can do? He left me in this comfort, the ladies. But I remember crying, saying, I've never had anyone, anyone to support me. And sometimes we don't know the support's there. It never occurred to me to ask for help before then. And that gave me the courage. They gave me the fight to don't go back to that. Yeah, you're right about the support. You don't realize what's out there. You need, but you need to ask because a lot of most people won't interfere, they won't come forward. No. He's quietly supporting you in the background. Um, but don't want to make any conscious effort to to say anything because for fear of um, you know being yelled at or or, or breaking a trust or, or doing whatever. So you, you you know you do you do have op- options uh, whether it be in your workplace, your family, your your friends network, even um, yeah uh, outer network. You know when you go to network meetings, you may have a favorite person that you that you interact with at these networking events and you know you might find that they could be a great support so you know don't be frightened to ask for help and asking for help is one of the hardest things to do and what I'd like to help you use the word earlier reframe is think of it this way if you saw somebody struggling down the street fell over or their shopping bag still split or the kid was about to run over the road. There's no cars, but they were about to run into the road. There are circumstances where you would just step in without thinking twice. Mm. And it makes us feel good to help. One of human nature, particularly women, is nurturing, community, being part of something. And helping out is actually in most of our DNAs. It's just what we do. By not asking for help when you freaking need it, is denying someone else the ability of giving. And that giving requires a little level of your worthiness to receive. That's why it's hard to ask, because you don't believe you're worthy of interrupting somebody's life to help you through yours. But I really would like you to consider being on an inner circle of someone's personal struggle, being Asking confidence for support is one of the most honoring things of humanity. So somebody tapping your shoulder and going, I have nowhere else to turn. Mm-hmm. Will you help me? It's the most gracious, gracious thing to be asked. So if you think there's somebody who can maybe be that person to start, just quietly one person. They might not put you up in their spare bedroom, but they might be able to do something. And that something starts the stepping stone of your pathway to change. Absolutely. Yeah, I totally agree with that. Mel, you've um, got some resources that you'd like to share with our audience today. 
Yes. So I have, so empathy is my thing. And when I say empathy, I, 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 I teach on how to be more empathetic, but also how to understand if you're an empath, which is completely different. So for both purposes, I have tools and resources that are free uh, on my website. So it's melb.com, mel with two L's, b.com forward slash resources. Super simple. And there's stuff, quizzes, all sorts in there to understand what kind of empath you are and a bunch of links to other podcasts and blah, 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 a whole heap of stuff in there. Lovely. Mel, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for joining me today and sharing your wisdom with us all. Um, I, You know that I love to talk to you. So, Thank you. <laughs> and, and I will talk to you again really soon. Okay, bye. Bye for now. Thank you for joining us for this episode of Healing Through Love. You can get further resources, see the show notes, or simply reach out to us via our website at htlaustralia.org. Thanks so much for joining us, and we look forward to your company next time on the Healing Through Love podcast. Music.